I guess what I'm going to talk about um, complements Kevin's uh, presentation, ex except with one uh, interesting quirk, and that is that we've looked at bushfires from a house's perspective rather than from um, the perspective of the fire itself. So prepared for a, a little twist in the, uh, the way you reflect on the process. I guess in, in the past, the, our fire loss statistics um, really don't show any particular pattern or rhyme and reason um, uh, over, the, over our history of uh, recorded data. Um, uh, so it's not something we know and can put a hand on our heart and say next summer's going to be a cracker and we're going to have h high losses uh, or, or not. So um, we really are at the whim of the, the weather and the, uh, and the fuel complexes that are always evolving and changing. I guess when you, when you aggregate um, the data um, of loss um, over Australia, you get some interesting um, perspectives. That's uh, all the, ag the large numbers of the aggregated numbers of actual homes lost between 1939 and 2009. And in the brackets, it's actually the number of uh, fatalities associated with, um, with the bushfires. Um, <coughs> that's actually overlaid over a colour scheme of Australia that um, uh, actually shows you uh, how many times a particular region's been burnt in the, in the past nine years. And what it really shows is um, that up in the north, there's uh, extensive fire frequency. Um, down in the south, we're nearly devoid of, um, of, uh, of constant uh, landscape fires. Um, so that begs the question, what is the driver? Is it our ongoing exposure to fire or its frequency, or is it, in fact, the uh, intensity of rare and unusual fires that are driving it? I guess what's also interesting to note is uh, the, the aggregated statistics um, look bad when you add them up from 1939 to 2009, but when you look at things like uh, deaths in domestic house fires and the number of houses you actually you lose in domestic fires actually eclipse these figures. So um, to keep things in perspective um, is quite important as well. I guess the fact that all the losses are aggregated around uh, a few iconic events certainly pushes it right up the political agenda and the community concern agenda because it really fights against this idea that um, society can control its own fate rather than um, find itself in uh, in scenarios where it really isn't in complete control of the situation. <coughs> this, is, this is a map that actually maps out or um, um, uh, is mainly driven by fire weather potential. And as you can see, it, it overlays a bit more sensibly against these statistics. So it's actually the potential for get really to, for, to achieve really extreme weather weather scenarios and where those weather scenarios overlay with, with fuels, that um, we start to see the fundamental drivers that, um, that set up various regions for the potential for, for larger losses. This is another way you can plot the data and, and we, we have a quite a, a lot of interesting debates with um, people developing building codes about what types of um, fire weather we, we should be thinking about when we're looking at designing against it. Um, there's, there's obviously a lot of pressure to, to um, pick a reasonably mild um, uh, uh, fire weather condition that uh, occurs regularly and people get the feel of, but in fact the reality is that um, it's right up into this 99.8.9 um, percentile weather condition, the very infrequent one, the one that you see a few times in your lifetime that actually dominate the, uh, the loss statistics in a given area. And what I've plotted here is actually the aggregated um, peak fire weather that you get over, over many years for a whole lot of different um, weather stations. We've got Hobart, Canberra, Sydney, Melbourne. And what we see is that each region actually has its own unique curve and sits different in a different place on that graph. Um, this is an important um, point to initially consider in that um, all places on, in Australia are not created equal. 
and that's um, one of the key reasons why, for instance, we've only ever lost around 43 houses in the, the recorded history of Australia in Queensland. It's, um, it's not because they've got an extremely effective policy. In fact, um, recent policies haven't affected these statistics for that, that much, really. It's because they're in a very different um, climatic scenario and have a very different fire weather potential. And that's one of the first really important steps for anyone to take in any region is what is my, what is the fire weather potential for my region? Um, what, what is interesting to note though is that uh, you can have regions that have very, very mild fire weather. So if you look at um, something like Hobart, it, it really lays out in, in the, the number of regular days are quite um, modest. But it's quite peculiar in that every once in a while it has a real clangor of a day. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's also important not to have this false sense of security around, um, around uh, what happens regularly and what, what the averages are and what the averages are doing and how climate change influences the averages. Um, but uh, what is my historic, what's the historic records that show these really infrequent events and how can we, we learn to be ready for those events as our, um, as our design scenario. This is the similar statistics, but it, um, uh, as I showed that earlier, earlier graph, and this is all of the losses we've ever had from 0% uh, to 100%. So that's sort of, you know, up around well over 10,000 houses is our cum total losses in Australia. And this is the F FFDI under which they've occurred. So what's interesting to note is, say, around an FFDI 100, we've actually lost more houses, um, more than 50% of all of our house losses has been on days that exceeded 100. Um, and there's only a couple of events. You can see the, the actual graph sort of makes a kick around each event just by the way the data is aggregated. So it's only sort of three or four events that are responsible for most of our house loss. What's, what's also interesting is uh, that down around this level, around 40 and 50, we actually haven't lost really, we don't really lose houses down below uh, 40 or 50 um, FFDI. And that, that sort of um, reflected a little bit in Kevin's um, uh, process where he's noting that once you're beyond that level, um, you, you're actually not effective in stopping fire in the landscape. Um, there actually seems to be a lull between when you can stop fire effectively in the landscape and when you start losing houses. So they're almost independent things, but it's uh, interesting to keep that in perspective. <coughs> you can also aggregate the data in this way, where you should look at uh, uh, FFDIs along the bottom and the potential for house loss um, on the vertical axis. So. The, the data suggests that if you're up around here and you've got active fire in the landscape, um, you might be looking at something like, you know, uh, uh, under 200 houses in the 75 to 99 range. If you're over, over 100, you're probably looking at, you know, 600 to 1,000 houses. You got the 95th percentile um, uh, likelihood here and, and in every case, you've got a high likelihood that you might come out with, uh, with no losses. It's just a way of sort of parameterizing it, but it really hopefully emphasizes the fact that as you push way out into the higher FFDIs, your potential for loss really um, can go exponential. And, and we've certainly been reminded in our recent history that the fires out in that um, pointy end of the process can really drive large iconic uh, loss events. So how do we how do we sort of put this in perspective? Um, well, we've got uh, we've got the forest, um, we've got an interface zone, and we've got houses. Now, in a 15-minute chat, I can only really talk about uh, a few components. So what I'm going to do is talk about this uh, this uh, um, interface zone in the middle here. This this interactive thing about what you can do between you and the unmanaged forest. And what's interesting to note is that there's a human behaviour content um, component around this whole process, and there's an environmental condition that obviously influences the severity of the um, 
at the forest and the fire behaviour in the forest, which Kevin's um, very well articulated, the environmental conditions are also um, modifying the vulnerability of the assets, the house itself and the areas around it. So the heavy fuel components and the, the fine fuel components in that urban context are dry and highly ignitable at exactly the same time as the forest fire behaviour is most severe and aggressive. It's a driver on both sides of the, of the risk process. So um, another take home is that from virtually all of our analysis from all fires, we get a very similar story coming back. And that is that well over 90% of the houses in, in each of these bushfires is actually lost in complete absence of the interaction of the, of the iconic fire front with the house itself. So the radiant heat and the flames aren't the key driver that's interacting directly with the houses. Instead, it's embers entering directly into the houses, igniting things directly on the houses, igniting things around the houses, and then them having an impact. Um, it's that aggregation, including um, igniting uh, neighbouring houses and then and having structure to structure spread. Um, so certainly solving, solving that fundamental issue from a house and urban design perspective, being prepared for that, is, is, a, is a primary um, a, um, approach before you then start really understanding um, your potential for direct, uh, direct flame and radiant heat interaction from an advancing fire front. And just as a, a bit of a case study, you'd say up in the Canberra fires, this was a, an esteemed fire scientist was actually living in this house here. And um, in, the, in the direction of the fire, which is um, to, uh, below the bottom of this uh, actual picture, there was uh, hundreds and hundreds of metres of an eaten out horse paddock that really technically had um, zero uh, fuel load. Um, the fire skipped across that in, and it was almost uh, indecipherable in, in, um, in being able to see it come across, but when it arrived at the interface, what did it find? Well, it found plenty of fuel. It, um, it quickly sw swept through and uh, moved over ignitable ground covers through the area and quickly passed through like this. And then there was a second phase of the process, which was the heavy fuel components in the urban environment that burnt out. These are, these are fences fences and uh, heavy ground cover and heavier tan bark. Um, all interacting over a longer duration and much more intimate in and around the house and offered probably some of the biggest challenges for the uh, active defence of that property. And just as a perspective, that, that picture there is taken from the back of the house looking out at that fence. So you can see a power pole burning, the fence all burning, um, the, uh, the sky filled with smoke, um, very interesting contextual scenario to try and prepare for uh, or, or feel like you're managing or in control or taking um, effective decisions to manage your own risk and uh, in a, such a circumstance. <coughs> Just some interesting pictures from like Air Peninsula. It's really around what, what is my local context? What is the um, scenario immediately around my house? And then look at, uh, at sort of uh, expanding eccentric, eccentric rings out from that point that really define my, the uh, scenario. Um, what can an adjacent house do to you? Um, how far back does it have to be to uh, have various threats of radiation? There's some good data out there for this sort of thing. Um, what do things immediately attached to my house um, present as a risk, like decks? <coughs> What, what is the context of fences as barriers in the landscape and as, as, um, as active uh, fuel agents that can present additional radiant heat and flame to the building? Um, and how do, you, how do you put all this in, into an idea and, and bring it together? And I'll just throw up a, a 3D modelling tool scenario that we're working on and, and working on in, integrating with um, Kevin's fire behaviour. Um, knowledge base and modelling capability. You have a topo top topography, you give the topography surface fuel characteristics, you uh, pl plonk houses into that, uh, into that landscape, um, 
there's actually uh, libraries of house designs um, already on the web and there's design tools for that sort of thing. Google SketchUp's an excellent uh, 3D um, you know, modeling process that, that uh, any member of the public can utilize. Fences, water tanks, uh, vegetation also plucked out of libraries. Um, intermediate zones between you and the forest. You can put uh, flame fronts in the forest. This is where you, you reach out to things like um, uh, modeling capabilities and fire behavior inputs. And then what if in that 3D scene you could actually interpret um, what, what's happening from the perspective of, of this window um, or a component on the house and how does it interact, how, how much radiant heat might come from components out there in the environment. So if you're looking out from that window, what can you see? Well, you can see various uh, trees, you can see certain amounts of the continuous forest, you're looking over and around objects. Um, we can actually um, do mathematical analysis using these, what we call ray queries, that actually um, take that visual scene and quantify it mathematically and hence tell you how much radiant heat you could get from any given component out in the landscape. So it's like, what is the house, what can the house see of its environment and some advancing uh, fire front? And then how do you aggregate that into running um, uh, time-based uh, scenes and how do you look at sort of critical failure modes that can lead to loss? So in this case, sort of spotting and radiant heat can ignite um, vegetation close to the houses. Um, that can be responsible for igniting a balustrade or a deck and the, the burning of that deck or balustrade is enough to take out a window, for example. Like that's one small um, thread or one small series of mechanisms that could lead to loss. Of course, there's many more that occur all in one scene. But you can start to unpick the design weaknesses and processes within, uh, within a, a given scenario. And I guess giving that knowledge base or understanding of risk or understanding of specific scenarios to the community, I think, is a small step forward in helping them um, be more accepting of their risk and, and um, have effective ways of choosing um, whether to modify or, or how to modify their particular scenarios. Thank you.